The audit committee is the hardest of the board committees to manage. The workload dwarfs the head of the other board committees. Not only will the audit committee be the committee primarily responsible for overseeing the financial stuff, the earnings releases, the audits, etc., they often get dragged into issues that aren't numbers related. Whistleblower complaints, internal investigations, internal audits come to mind. The audit committee meetings often involve a parade of people coming and going. They have a large group of people from inside and outside the company that attend portions of the meeting. The CFO, controller, head of internal audit and compliance internally, the outside auditor, outside counsel for any investigations from the outside. The audit committee meets in executive session often. So how do you effectively run a meeting like this so it doesn't become a complete zoo today on Zippy Point? I'm Brock Romanek and I'm a big fan of you. The audit committee can be hard to handle, so effective time management can be key. Here are five things related to audit committee meetings you should know. One, involve yourself in the prep session. Two, speak up when necessary. Three, ensure minutes meet regulatory requirements. Four, don't blindside the committee. Five, maintain a list of follow-up actions. One, involve yourself in the prep session. So before each audit committee meeting, the audit committee chair, the CFO, controller, maybe the, the internal auditor too, should hold a prep session to rehearse for what's gonna be on the committee's agenda. These prep sessions often take place after a draft agenda is already created, but the agenda might up being tweaked, revised, based on the discussion during the prep session. The prep session occurs before the board materials are delivered, typically lasting about an hour, but it could be several hours or it could be shorter. It's important you, as the governance expert, attend the prep session to ensure that they're planning for the things that are necessary and fall into your area of expertise. A lot of the time you won't add value to the prep session, perhaps 75% of the time, but a quarter of the time you will add value. They'll be lucky you were there. That's a pretty high percentage. This is also a good time for the audit committee chair to get any of their questions answered. There's nothing worse than the chair aiming a zinger at the controller during an audit committee meeting when that concern could have been alleviated during a prep session. The prep session also is a good time to explain and then answer any questions the chair might have about any new accounting rules. Sometimes explaining a new regulatory position can eat up much of the time of an audit committee meeting at the expense of topics that really are more pressing. Explaining a new auditing standard seems actually like the ideal kind of thing that can be turned into a video presentation that could be shared with all the audit committee members in addition to the written materials sent in advance of the committee meeting. So the video presentation that explains the rule change would just be sent out as part of the committee materials. The video wouldn't include any sensitive information about the company, so there's no really security risk about it being shared or hacked. That way, the time spent at the meeting about the rule change can be limited to any questions the directors have. Two, speak up when necessary. They don't you teach you this one in school. Sometimes you have to get up the nerve to interrupt the meeting so the committee takes an action that it forgot to take. Perhaps the committee discussed the matter, but a formal vote wasn't held. Or perhaps an agenda item was accidentally skipped over and action on that topic is absolutely necessary at this meeting. This can be quite hard to do. You'll probably get the the side eye. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure in the room for you to stay quiet. You might be embarrassing the audit committee chair, but, and, and of course you might be considered to be derailing a meeting that everyone wants in the room. Everyone in the room wants it to end, but you have to do it to protect them, even if it hurts. Three, ensure minutes meet regulatory requirements. The audit committee is jam-packed with activity, so it's easy to let your pen flow when taking minutes but you're not bothering to add in the regulatory buzzwords that make it easier for those reading the minutes later to know that the audit committee did indeed meet its regulatory requirements. This goes to the point I just made. It's your job to ensure the committee meets its regulatory requirements, and it's also your job to document it when they do. The minutes should specifically tie a committee action to the regulatory requirement it fulfills. So when you're writing up the final minutes, edit them so that they tie together the action taken and the regulatory requirement, tied them in a neat bow so it's easy to see the audit committee fulfilled its obligation. Tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. It's been four long years. I don't <laughs> you know the bow. To be clear, I'm not saying you should fictionalize the minutes. They should be accurate. You don't want to say the audit committee took actions that it didn't take. I'm saying 
be eloquent in your wording to match the language of the rules and regulations that triggered the actions that the committee took. Then when the independent auditors or other interested parties, including regulators, when they review your committee minutes, they can easily check off that the committee has done its work well. It's clear that the committee has done what's required by law. Four, don't blindside the committee. There's no quicker way to get yourself in hot water with the audit committee than having them be needlessly blindsided by something that they could have seen coming. This typically happens with risks. For example, an accounting position was taken long ago that entailed some risk, and now some time has passed and that risk has grown. Or the regulations have changed to forbid the ad activity that poses our risk that was a small risk, but now with the regulatory change, it's become a big risk. Or the company has hired a new independent auditor who doesn't quite take the same position as the old auditor on something you're doing, so that what you're doing is now more risky in the eyes of your new auditor. From the perspective of an audit committee member, something like this should have been discussed occasionally at the audit committee level over time, because people within your controller's office, in your office too perhaps, knew that this risk has been percolating. It's, it's been around. So it's your job to remind the controller, the CFO, to update the audit committee regularly about risk. Maybe ask specifically, are there any new developments related to an increased level of risk at the prep session each and every time to keep them thinking this way? Phrase it maybe a little bit differently every time so it sounds like you're saying something new and they're just not going to routinely say no. At a minimum, include a risk conversation at least quarterly on the audit committee agenda. This is more than just reviewing the risk factors that you've disclosed in your SEC filings, in your audit report. These are risks specific to the jurisdiction of the audit committee. So you're constantly checking in on the heat map for the audit committee, having them discuss the relative risks and possible mitigation strategies. You're ensuring that the company's chief risk officer attends your quarterly risk meetings and that you're working with that risk officer to fine tune how the risks are defined. That officer is getting reports from risk spotters throughout the company. These risk spotters tend not to be lawyers, so their description of the risks, including the mitigation strategies they're considering, considering, might not be as accurately described as they should be. This can be a real problem. Without that legal background, they might not be considering the legal ramifications of the risks or the legal ramifications of the mitigation strategies, either at all or, or as much as they should. So they might need your help and might not even be aware of that they need to be doing this. They also might need help considering reputational risk, the public relations risk, PR risk, as well as the availability of business interruption insurance and other factors that make risk such a big part of a company's overall strategy. Risk can be so big at companies that the board has a separate risk committee. This is becoming more and more popular that boards have a separate risk committee. So, for example, having a risk committee is a standard practice in the financial services industry, and it's growing in other industries, too. Five, maintain a list of follow-up actions. Audit committee meetings tend to be jam-packed, so it's easy for, to forget who promised what and when during the course of these long meetings. Take it upon yourself to be the one that writes up the list of the studies, additional information, future presentations, and anything else that anyone proffers during the meeting. Then circulate that list to the folks who were volunteer to be involved in doing the actual following up. It could have been someone that was giving a presentation. It might have been the CEO. It might have just been a made a request from a director of someone who wasn't even at the meeting. Include in that list when you want that follow up to happen. Have a deadline <laughs> and remind people of the deadline and keep the pressure on. All this will make you look good in the eyes of the board. They'll know that someone is on top of the care and feeding of the board, and it will inspire confidence that if they ask, you'll deliver. Mm -hmm.